Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to Radcliffe Chambers Pupillage Webinar. Uh, my name's Dan Thorpe and I'm one of the junior barristers in Chambers. Uh, you'll see on your screens, or hopefully you'll see them when, when their time to speak comes up, I'm joined by Daniel Burton, who's one of our more senior juniors in Chambers, who specialises in who specialises in private client work. Uh, we've also got Louis Grandjuan, who is one of our most junior tenants, having completed pupillage in October last year. And we're also joined by Amber Turner, who is one of our current pupils, and uh, she's going to be speaking later on about what that entails. Uh, but the aim of tonight, um, as hopefully you'll have seen from the um, marketing and the, the, the links that we advertise, is to demystify to the extent we can in less than one hour, uh, precisely what the commercial chancery name tag involves at our chambers. In other words, we, we identify ourselves as a commercial chancery chambers. But what does that actually mean on the ground? What are chambers core practice areas? What makes up the more commercial work we do? What makes up the more traditional cases um, that we are involved with? And specifically, I think relevant to, to people at your stage of, of the application process or, or potentially at your stage of the application process, how do those things translate to uh, being a junior tenant, being a pupil? Uh, and so, yeah, that's tonight. Okay, uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan Burton, who is going to give us a bit of an insight into what uh, a more traditional chancery practice involves at Radcliffe Chambers. Dan. Yeah, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I guess the slightly glib first thing to say is that traditional chancery practice uh, means you wear a tie. Um, but I wouldn't call it just that. Um, first question, really, uh, and the question that I wanted to ask when I was at this stage, feels like a long time ago now, was what, what is traditional chancery? What, what is it and why is it called traditional chancery? Isn't it just chancery? Well, I think the answer is that there are four, four main areas uh, of practice, which uh, I do, and I consider myself a, a traditional chancery practitioner. And those broadly are trusts, uh, probate, real property, and charities. Now, it, it all sounds rather old fashioned, but it, in, in reality, these four areas affect the lives of many people, um, rich or poor in this jurisdiction and in other jurisdictions. And um, I think the best thing for me to do is really give you some examples and talk to you about some of the types of work that I do and other uh, members of the uh, traditional Chancery Group at Radcliffe do. Um, I should say that, that there are other terms for this sort of work. Lots of people, um, you'll hear the phrase private client as well, which also in, in, uh, encapsulates um, uh, work, including uh, probates uh, and, and trust as well. But for the term traditional chancery, again, it's really four main areas. So trusts, uh, probate, real property and charities. So looking at probate, uh, and again, the term probate's rather old fashioned, what, what it really means is inheritance disputes. Um, usually disputed wills, but also um, claims that people have on estates if they've been uh, left out of a will, for example, or if there is no will. Now, um, cases really, uh, in my experience, um, involve a family element. It's almost like family law where there's been a, a, a death rather than a divorce. Um, there's lots of evidence in these types of cases. Um, so I won't be fooled into thinking it's just about black letter law. Although when you first look at the practitioner's text, I remember looking at Williams, Mortimer and Sonnex and Theobald for the first time, there is quite a lot of law to get through. But once, once you've got your head around that, the reality about these cases is they turn on their facts. And at any given time, uh, members might have 10 to 15 uh, uh, probate cases or in inheritance disputes on the go. And um, certainly since the coronavirus pandemic and the um, rise of house prices and cost of living, you know, pe people tend to be very conscious about um, the um, family and people have expectations about in inheritance. And there are, in, in my experience, certainly there are a very common type of disputes. Um, any traditional chancery practitioner will have their bread and butter work uh, probate. And the type of arguments that are raised, well, they, they, they range really from challenges of mental capacity. I, I spent all day thinking about a conference I got tomorrow morning about a testamentary capacity challenge. Um, often cases where you have uh, age-related mental impairment, cases of dementia, Alzheimer's, um, but you, you have other allegations, some more salacious and lurid of undue influence or fraudulent calumny, the, the poisoning of the mind. Um, you know, some, some of the 
factual scenarios you, you, you see wouldn't be out of place in something like EastEnders or Coronation Street. So um, th th those are the sort of types of cases, but you also get more prosaic ones where there's simply a will that's not, that's not been executed properly. And these things have a very um, large effect on people's lives. And often there might be attendant professional negligence issues as well. So any uh, traditional transfer practitioner really needs to be up on uh, prof neg elements as well. So, I mean, I, I personally really enjoy probate uh, disputes. I, I, I find it varied, uh, I find them interesting and I find them challenging. Um, I'd say it's, you know, the reality is it's your bread and butter work from the very early days of um, uh, practice the bar and it goes all, all the way up to being uh, more senior as well. So that's the first of the four main sort of tenets of traditional chancery work. Uh, the second is trusts. Now, despite sounding a bit old fashioned and uh, Victorian, trusts are still very popular. Um, the vast majority of trusts you'll come across are actually in wills. So you, you might be dealing with them in the context of a will uh, dispute, but also there, there, there is still a preference for lifetime settlements. But um, a lot of trust work these days is offshore, uh, mostly due to um, tax reasons. And so, for example, um, much of the work will be in places like Jersey or the British Virgin Islands, Bermuda, Guernsey, etc. And you know, give an example, five of our members in the past year or so have been working on the Grandview case in Bermuda, which is an enormous couple of trusts. Um, and that case has recently been in the Privy Council, and I, you know, I'm sure there's more cases um, on that. So um, from the sort of top end down, uh, many members have gone on to Commons. It's possible to go to the BVI or to go to Jersey. And there's certainly a lot of offshore work around and Chambers can, can offer that. So that's probate and trusts. Um, real property is the third area. And, and again, it's a slightly odd phraseology. It just means land. and um, Obviously, you would have done land law, whether it's on the GDL or uh, an undergrad. And you obviously know that there's lots of law in land and um, disputes can range really, even co-ownership, um, talata disputes, easements, uh, re restrictive covenants. And land really permeates many things. And any chancery practitioner has got to have a good uh, sounding in uh, land law, but the more specialist elements certainly fall within the traditional chancery ambit. And um, uh, again, th this can be a complex, but also a rewarding area to, to practice in. Um, and again, there's certainly lots of black letter law, but it's about how you um, really use the, 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 the facts. For example, junior practitioners might be doing boundary disputes, which get very complicated. You need lots of surveying evidence and maps and um, site visits, for example. But um, a really classic example and one which I, I remember came up all the time in law school. I wasn't sure how much I'd see it in practice, but actually there is lots of it in practice and that's proprietary estoppel. Um, um, two members recently were in the Supreme Court case of guest and guest, which looked at uh, proprietary estoppel. Uh, it, it almost got abolished, but it was um, resurrected and the doctrine uh, uh, definitely survived and is now in uh, rude health. So. Um, you know, anyone thinking that they want to be involved in proprietary estoppel cases, that's absolutely the kind of thing you, you do as a um, chancery practitioner. Often they might arise in the context of a probate dispute. People will argue, well, actually, this bit of land isn't in the estate because it's been promised to me. Um, so it's certainly something that does come up in uh, real life, especially with agricultural clients. It's um, quite, quite, a, quite a popular course of action in my experience. So. Um, Probate, trust, real property, um, again, all um, diet of chancery practitioners. And the final one's charities. Now, Chambers has got a long and proud uh, uh, tradition in charity practice, and it wasn't something which I was familiar with at all until I came to Radcliffe. And um, it really involves contentious, but also non-contentious elements of charity work and uh, charity administration. Now, sometimes it can throw up very weird and wonderful cases. And I've, I've been involved in a case uh, the past um, two or three years with um, leading counsel in our chambers, Robert Pierce, uh, called the National Fund. Uh, uh, and this is a rather extraordinary case of a gift to the nation from a wealthy and famous investment banker back in the 1920s. And the money has been accumulating ever since. And there's a pot of about 600 million pounds, which is a gift to the nation. And the, the, the key question in this case is what to do with 600 million pounds that has been given to the nation. Now, not time to go into it today, but if you're interested in that, the, um, the answer's in the judgment. 
And to me, it always seemed like a sort of good dinner party question if you got asked the kind of work you did. Well, I'd say, well, yes. And what 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 would you do if you had a gift of 600 million pounds that had to be given to the nation in which you live? So those are the one example of the sort of thing that uh, charity uh, um, uh, law can can throw out. And I think those four elements really are the sort of key elements to traditional chancery. Now, just finally, uh, I would say that there is a constant overlap and although I consider myself a chancery practitioner, I, I, I did have a grounding in insolvency and commercial work. I worked at a commercial firm for a year before coming to the bar and I am doing some consumer credit group banking action, for example. But um, quite a good example um, is with uh, David Moyadin, who I'm gonna hand over to uh, presently. And David and I involved in, in, in a case, we were speaking about the case today. And um, that, for example, is uh, it, it is a, commercial chancery case involving receivers and sale of company assets and judgment debts and it, it relates to the sale of a football club and so in that context I'm working as a sort of um, traditional chancery junior uh, looking at the a particular jurisdiction which operates in trust in the trust world but it's been moved over into the insolvency work and David and I are in the um, court of opinion in February on that one and I think that's a great example of how actually um, the two worlds, if you say, of traditional and commercial chancery can uh, collide. So I hope that's a suitable segue to hand over to David. Thanks, Dan. I think that's, I think you're right. I think that's a convenient point to, to hand over to uh, David, who I didn't introduce at the start, other than to say that he was uh, rushing to, to come and join us. But um, yeah, I'll hand over to David Moyes in KC, who's uh, one of our silks and chambers, to tell you a little bit more about the more commercial elements of practice uh, in our chambers. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, it's very nice to talk to you. Um, I thought what might be useful is to split these few minutes I've got into three parts. Um, one to talk about me, because which barrister doesn't like talking about themselves? Um, secondly, to tell you what I do, the sort of work I do and what my typical day might look like. Um, and then just talk a bit more broadly about commercial chancery work. Uh, and what that means in contrast to the work that Dan's told you about, but also picking up that overlap that he's just mentioned. Um, so, um, I, I'm 1999 call, I took Silk in 2016. Um, I was made a bencher of Lincoln's Inn in 2018. Um, I became a recorder, a civil only recorder, that's a part-time judge in the county court, 2019, and I do predominantly chancery work so although actually I don't practice much in land law property type law those are the sorts of cases I hear in the county court and then um, in 2021 I became a deputy high court judge in the chancery division where thankfully they do give me occasionally things that I know something about or at least that I claim to know something about. Um, I did my pupillage in two parts so I did my first six in London chambers and then went uh, back north where I'm from and I practiced in the north for about 20 years and I came to Radcliffe Chambers in 2020 um, and that's where I now uh, practice from. Um, what, what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well my caseload um, has lessened in number of cases since I took Silk um, and the juniors will tell you they do uh, a much greater volume of cases than the Silks do. Um, my cases last a bit longer um, and they're a bit bigger, inevitably. Um, so I probably have six or seven cases on the go uh, at any one time. Uh, those cases can range from insolvency, I do a lot of. Um, I've dealt with one of the energy supplier insolvencies. I've done quite a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lending insolvency work. Um, recently, um, I do some spin-off professional negligence work where uh, I uh, represent insolvency practitioners uh, accused of professional negligence. Uh, I spent a long time uh, before I took Silk doing director's disqualification work on behalf of the government. Um, and I'm now instructed um, in a very big disqualification case arising out of the collapse of Carillion PLC, which comes on for trial in October this year uh, for six months, um, if it goes all the way. Um, so that's taking up a lot of my time. Um, I do quite a lot of company law work. So that's sort of technical company law issues, but it's also disputes between shareholders. 
where business people have fallen out with one another. It's claims on um, what are called warranties when somebody sells a business or the shares in a business looking to make their millions from the idea they've had. Um, and they claim the company's in very good health and making lots of money, and it might or might not be. And when that goes wrong, the buyer sues the seller. So I do that sort of work. Um, I do a lot of fraud work, so civil fraud where assets have been taken often by directors, um, and we try and get it back. Um, and um, I do straightforward contract disputes um, between often commercial entities um, arguing about a contract that they've had. Uh, and what it means uh, uh, and what uh, the result ought to be and whether somebody's breached it or not. So I spend um, now a lot more of my time um, sitting behind my desk, uh, doing paperwork, reading case papers, doing advices, mostly now actually by Zoom or by Teams since COVID. Um, uh, my work is more or less entirely paperless now, that's personal choice. Uh, but one of the things that COVID did do was switch people to electronic working. Um, despite the fact I have a few law books behind me that you can probably see, most of the resourcing's online now. Um, and so um, have laptop will travel and you can do your work uh, wherever you choose to. I'm at home today, so I'm able to zoom in to, to talk to you all. Um, so I spend most of my days here um, or at my desk in chambers or in con meeting with clients. While I'm in court, I tend to be in court for quite a while um, and not doing much else um, because uh, the case um, requires me to be there for uh, more than a few days. Um, as I say, I've been involved in the Carillion disqualification proceedings. I'm doing that case with Dan that he mentioned, where there's a very big overlap between what's actually a trust law principle that has been applied into an insolvency and company law context. Uh, and one of the questions for the Court of Appeal will, will be whether that's been done properly uh, or whether that needs some refinement. Uh, and so we've got a day in the Court of Appeal um, at the end of February um, arguing uh, about that. Um, in, when I do go to court, uh, I'm generally in uh, one of the business and property courts, as they're now called, usually in the Chancery Division, um, but sometimes in the Commercial Court. Uh, sometimes in the Court of Appeal. Uh, and for the sort of work I do, there's also a specialist jurisdiction where the insolvency and companies court judges have specific jurisdiction to deal with those sorts of cases. So bankruptcies, company winding ups, administrations, disqualification cases, that sort of thing going front of specialist judges, um, usually with specialist barristers in front of them. Um, uh, and then moving into the third uh, part of what I wanted to say this evening, um, to talk more generally about commercial chancery work. So it's all those things I've spoken about that I do. Uh, it's also commercial disputes in a very broad sense, um, whether that's in court or arbitration. Um, we do mediations um, where we try and resolve clients' disputes without the need for a formal decision. Um, partnership matters, um, cross-border work. Um, a, a number of people do international work where they're acting for international clients or appearing in overseas courts. Um, and those cases, whether they're domestic or otherwise, are heard at all levels of jurisdiction. So in the domestic context, from the district judges in the county courts, uh, the masters in the high court, the high court judges and beyond. And you've heard Dan talk about court of appeal and privy council and supreme court cases uh, and members of chambers. Uh, are uh, involved in, in all of those things. So I, I suppose in conclusion, um, what I can say is the commercial chancery work is very business focused, um, tends to be for commercial clients um, in a business context, which keeps it interesting, uh, brings it to life, um, and often touches on things that actually really do matter um, to people in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think that was all I wanted to say, Dan. Thanks very much, David. Um, I might jump in with a quick question. So, uh, David and Dan, both of you have referred to a case that you're doing together. One of the questions we've had in, uh, and I will encourage uh, attendees to, to, to pop some questions into the Q&A box as we go along, but one of the questions we've had in is how does that work? How do you do these cases together? I mean, we refer to being led 
Um, so I, maybe one of you could explain a little bit about um, what the relationship is there between a KC and a junior barrister. David, you want, uh, yeah, you want me to go first, all right. Um, so um, as, as a junior, you do, you do your own work on your own case. Um, and occasionally you'll think that you want somebody more senior or more specialist to come and give you a hand on it. Or the other way around, the silk will have a case uh, and they will need some specialist input, which is what's happened in the case that Dan and I are doing. Um, where I've asked him to come and get involved because he's got specialist trusts knowledge um, that I need to help me um, make my own arguments in my insolvency context. Okay? Uh, what that's meant for our case is that we divide up the work. Um, we um, Dan tends to do the first draft of any documents that we have to produce, and then I will feed into those. And obviously that's very easy now because he emails me his draft and I work on it on my screen and send it back to him. And between us, we can very quickly get to the polished document. Um, when we prepare for court, what um, we'll do is sit down together and work through the arguments that we're going to make um, uh, in oral submission, in spoken argument to the court. And then my job on the day will be to present those arguments um, to the court. No doubt being prodded behind by Dan when I've got it wrong. And he thinks I should have said something uh, completely different. Dan, how does that sound? Well, I think the important thing and perspective from a junior's uh, position is that it, it, work, working with leading counsel is uh, a, it's a privilege and it's something that you need to learn to do as a junior. You really need to feed into the particular type of working that, that your leader has and that, that there's no set way of doing it. Um, for example, there, some leaders have particular ways of working and you, you, you need to work as quickly as possible to complement that. Um, uh, David's absolutely right. The, the, the way modern um, work at the bar is, is teamwork. You know, you, you, you will have a number of different teams. You will have, you know, you might have a partner, an associate, a junior solicitor, you might have a paralegal leading counsel, you might have more than one junior occasionally. And it's vitally important to be able to work as a team at the bar. I think the sort of days with the perception of, um, you know, especially more on the chancery field of people working by themselves is just not really the case in, in, anymore. And um, the, you know, the key thing as a junior is that although you, you might be more focused on the paperwork initially, if God forbid anything happens to your leader on the day, you've got to be ready to step in. And so it's not the case of when you go into court, you can sit back and relax because you've done your bit. Um, and, you know, of, often Dave, for example, will, need a hand during the hearing or might need a reference to something might might need a, something on a post-it note or quite often he might say stop sending me post-it notes <laughs> I've got this point so it's about relationships and judgment and I think quite quite a lot of the uh, working at the bar is about relationships and judgment and the relationship between leader and junior is no is no real different. I think Thanks. sorry I was just going to oh. say um, in, in one of my other cases we I'm operating in a team of two silks and four juniors alongside um, a very big team from the solicitors. So I, I, I uh, agree entirely with Dan, it's all about teamwork and being able to join a team and which will already exist by the time you're brought in as a barrister um, and um, get into that team and, and add, you know, add value to it very quickly. Thanks, David uh, and Dan. Um, We've had another question actually that, that talks about the diet of work for juniors. So this is probably a good time for me to introduce Louis, um, who, as I say, completed pupillage in October last year. Uh, so he's going to uh, give us a, a little bit of information of, about his experience as, as one of the most junior tenants in Chambers. So uh, Louis, over to you. Thanks, Jan. Um, yeah, so I was going to speak to you uh, about my, my sort of day to day, um, about my, my practice um, and then about my transition from being a pupil um, at Radcliffe last year to being a um, one of the most junior tenants uh, this year. So the rhythm of my week uh, tends to be dictated by how often I'm in court um, and at the moment that tends to be around uh, three days a week. So this week I've got hearings uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday and Friday. So I spent today preparing for those which means to sort of think about the submissions I'm going to make, maybe preparing a skeleton argument, speaking to my solicitors. And I've also had a bit of time to work on things which are sort of puttering along in the background. So there's, there's a bit of pro bono um, and I've got some what we call paperwork. So here it's drafting some pleadings. But my big sort of priority at the moment 
is uh, being uh, in court as much as possible. Uh, and there are a few reasons for that. And, and David's touched, touched on them already, I think. Um, at its most basic level, it's a lot of fun, and it's the sort of core of the job. Uh, but also, as you become more senior at the Chancery Bar, uh, the opportunities to be in court very often become slightly rarer because you're working on bigger cases or you're being led on bigger cases. And the real, the quite precious thing, I think, um, when you're a very, very junior Chancery Barrister is really that you can be in court as much as you want, um, as much as you can sort of take on. Uh, and so, what, what does that look like in practice? So, so I've, I've tried to keep a very broad chancery practice at this stage. Um, so I do everything from corporate insolvency to property by a private client to charities. Um, and that's actually what initially attracted me to Radcliffe. Uh, it has real strength across the full spectrum of the chancery bar. Now, in terms of the hearings that that translates to, uh, there are a few classics for any uh, very junior chancery barrister. Um, starting with possession hearings, where you're trying to recover uh, a property from someone, so that could be a, a tenant or a, a squatter, or defending a tenant, or a, um, that's slightly more rare, um, and uh, bankrupts or winding up petitions. So that's where what's at stake is whether a person should be made bankrupt or whether a, a company should be liquidated. Now, these can be very short hearings, as short as sort of 10 to 15 minutes, but as soon as they're defended, they can become more substantial. They can take a couple of hours or up to a day. So that's a big part of what I spend my time doing. But beyond that, things become very diverse very quickly. So looking over the past few months, uh, there have been cases involving an allegation that a, an estate is held on trust. Um, and that was a, 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 it was listed for what we call a summary judgment hearing, which was going to last up to a day. Uh, then there are short trials, in my case, never lasting more than a day. Uh, but that can be anything from a dispute about property to um, a complaint that some sort of financial product has been missold. Uh, and along the way, all sorts of applications, um, for example, to enforce a charge um, or to do with the way a company is being run or for some sort of remedy uh, and all sorts of interim case management hearings. And that can be quite a good thing at my very junior stage uh, to become um, involved in slightly more substantial cases. Um, now, the, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was the switch from um, pupillage to uh, tenancy. So at Radcliffe, which is, and this is unusual for a uh, commercial transfer set, uh, you have a what we call a practicing second sixth. Uh, and so Amber will be able to talk to you a little bit more about pupillage, but um, six months into her pupillage and six months into mine, you start on taking your own cases uh, while you're still a, a pupil. And that's quite a carefully managed process. So your supervisor will screen cases before you take them on and you'll let into the your own sort of cases quite quite slowly because the point when you're a pupil is to learn how to do the job uh, and so you, you remain involved in your supervisor's work but progressively in the second half of your year you start taking on more and more of your cases until in the final three months in the run-up to tenancy um, you're really mostly doing your own work and that's I think really valuable because it makes for a completely seamless transition into tenancy. Uh, you already have some cases under your belt. So to put it bluntly, you've got some money coming in the first few months of, of tenancy, which is, uh, which is actually quite important. You've got to pay your rent. Um, and you're not thrown off the precipice of uh, having to do everything on your own for the first time in your first few months of practice. But I don't want to give the impression that um, once you become a tenant, once you finish being a pupil, that's, that's it, you're on your own. Um, one of the great pleasures of working in chambers, I tend to come in every day, uh, is being able to discuss cases. So I, sh I share this room with uh, Jamie, who is my co-pupil, uh, and Piers, who was in the year above me in, in, in Dan's year. Um, and they're very good sounding boards. But then I've got um, back there in the room next door, one of my old supervisors. Uh, and over the corridor on the other side, um, another supervisor, uh, who are always very happy to um, be asked questions about things which I haven't come across before. So it makes for a pretty sort of supportive environment to work in, even though you're self-employed and the cases that you're doing are your own cases. Uh, but that's all I really wanted to say about that. Uh, thanks very much, Lily. Um, just, just so hopefully that answers the question about the, the diet of work for juniors. Um, the, the second part of that question was that it's, uh, to what extent uh, it's desirable to, to get experience of lead and, and unled work led and independent work. 
Um, perhaps I can answer that. Uh, I think it is desirable from my perspective, you know, as David uh, sort of said, you know, it's inevitable that the silks in chambers and the more senior members of chambers are doing cases which are bigger, um, which are higher, you know, have a higher value, they're in the higher courts. And as a, uh, a baby junior, if you can get um, a little bit of experience of that sort of work, you know, um, it's really exciting, it's fun, and it's things that might take you out of uh, the ordinary day-to-day -day of a chancery practitioner um, and away from the hearings, as fun as they are, uh, that Louis has, has described. Um, but good, now Louis mentioned pupillage there, um, and I think this is appropriate time to hand over to Amber, who um, is three and a half months into pupillage, uh, but hopefully has already got a sense of what um, the process involves at our chambers. Um, so Amber. Thanks, Anne. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so I am one of the two current pupils at Radcliffe. Um, next year, we're going up to three pupils. Um, so things will be, I, I don't think they'll be materially different in any respect, but there will be slightly more of you um, to, to share, the, share the stress um, and also the joys with. Um, so I've been asked to talk about what it's like to be a pupil in a commercial chancery set and specifically at Radcliffe um, and I'm going to do that but first I am going to just say a bit about my path to pupillage um, and the application process that got me here. So I studied law as an undergraduate um, I knew that I wanted to do law and I didn't want to study anything else anymore so I just thought I'll go straight into that and I think It'd be fair to say quite early on, I, I also knew that I wanted to be a barrister, um, but I think that there are various misconceptions about the bar. Um, and I must say that these came mostly from my fellow students rather than from members of the bar. Um, and initially that did put me off a little bit, uh, particularly as, I guess, as a woman looking at the commercial chancery bar and also coming from a slightly more non-traditional background, um, I did feel that I wasn't sure that it was for me. So I got myself onto a couple of mentoring and access schemes uh, through the inns, and that helped me to, to see that actually some of the things I'd heard just were a bit inaccurate and that there was space for people like me at the bar. So I went off and did the bar course and uh, during my bar course year, I applied for pupillage and uh, was successful. And uh, so that was two years ago and um, so I was in your position this time two years ago and uh, yeah I, I know what it's like to be writing those applications in the cold dark month of January but you're all doing very well. Um, yeah so I did a, a mini pupillage at Radcliffe in December 2020. It had been rearranged from March 2020 for obvious reasons and that gave me in, uh, an insight into chambers for when I was writing those pupillage applications in, in January 2021. So I was able to write in my covering letter about what I knew about chambers and what I liked about chambers and what I, I thought I could, um, what I thought was suitable about me for chambers. So that got me a first round interview, um, which I actually thought was quite a lot of fun. Um, it was about 15 minutes. It was very debate-ish and the questions were quite topical and quite interesting, I thought. And actually, I was asked questions about myself, which might sound strange, but for those of you who haven't done pupillage interviews before, that doesn't actually happen as often as you might think. So it was quite nice to feel at the end of that interview, like I'd been able to present um, sort of a picture of myself that I thought was accurate and fair. And thankfully that got me a second round interview. And before that second round interview, I had to prepare a written opinion. And then the first 15 minutes of the second round interview were spent discussing the opinion. So I was asked essentially to justify the conclusions that I'd come to and challenged uh, a little bit on those conclusions, um, but that was quite an interesting exercise. Um, and then there was a mock client conference. So the members of the pupillage panel uh, were acting as clients or as solicitors, um, and I was acting as barrister, and that lasted again in about 15 minutes. And then there was a, sort of another half an hour 
where I was answering questions about um, my motivations to, to come to the bar, uh, to come to the Chan commercial chancery bar and to come to Radcliffe. Uh, and again, questions just about myself more generally. So I would say um, that the application process as a whole um, is obviously quite challenging, um, and, uh, but I did, I did quite enjoy it um, in a weird way. And by the end of it, I think Dan actually said this to me um, when I was on my mini pupillage in December 2020. Um, but by the end of it, um, I, I did feel like I thought if I don't get pupillage here, then that's fair enough because they have made a proper assessment of of what I uh, who I am and what I would bring. So that that I thought that that was a really positive experience. Uh, so. Moving on to what it's like to actually be a pupil in a commercial chancery set. The, I'm gonna cover sort of four topics that I think will help you to understand what that's like. So firstly, the way that pupils is structured at Radcliffe is that you do four seats of three months, each with a different supervisor. And as Louis, Louis talked about, your first six months are non-practicing, so you're not doing any of your own work. But then in the second six months, you are doing some of your own work as well as the sort of work that you're doing in first six. So I'm going to leave all the stuff about second six to what Louis already very helpfully said, because he is uh, obviously much more experienced on that than me. So in terms of the first six months, though, um, so far I've done one full seat, which was traditional chancery. So the kind of things that Dan was talking about earlier, um, I saw uh, probate, trusts, charities and property, actually the full range of traditional chancery stuff. And just now I'm sitting with a, an insolvency barrister, so seeing more insolvency, commercial um, and some company stuff. Um, so, so the idea being that you will see both commercial and traditional chancery across the whole period of your pupillage. The work itself um, is, a, what, is a mixture of what we call live and dead work. So you'll be doing both work that your supervisor is working on at the same time as you are, which can be quite helpful because you see how things actually work in real time. And dead work, which is more exciting than it sounds, um, it's work that your supervisor has done already. Um, and they just give you what they were given at the beginning of when they were doing the work and you produce something hopefully a little bit like what they ended up producing. And at the end of that, you'll uh, go through it with them, get some feedback and hopefully have um, their work to compare yours against, which is also really helpful. The actual pieces of work themselves um, might be sort of written advices on opinions. Um, you might draft skeleton arguments and statements of case, like particular claim and defences. You might be asked sometimes to just produce a note of research. So that might be if your supervisor is working on a large case and they just need um, advice on a discrete point of law that's come up and you can summarise for them where they might find the answers to that. And essentially, all of those things add up to quite a lot of time reading and researching. So it is quite academic. Um, and if you enjoyed studying law at university, you'll probably enjoy this. But equally, if you didn't, it is more practical than that. You are applying the law to, to real world questions. So yeah, West Law is my best friend. I spend most of the day um, on West Law or surrounded by textbooks, um, but that's what I enjoy. So that's essentially what it looks like. The pure logistics of it, um, Chambers core business hours are nine till six, but it does depend on your supervisor within what periods you'll be in. So with my first supervisor, I was in 9.30 till six most days. And with my current supervisor, it's more like nine till 5.30. Um, but you do actually benefit from the fact that your supervisor is self-employed. So if your supervisor wants to leave a bit early one day, then you might be able to leave early with them. And, and that's quite nice, um, but it does depend on the supervisor. There's some flexibility with regards to working from home. Um, the Pupilage Committee recommends coming in sort of a minimum of three or four days a week. Um, myself and my co-pupil basically come in every day, um, but that's just because there are quite a few benefits to coming in. 
and you get to see members of chambers and you get to be in the same room as your supervisor and direct questions to them just when they come to you rather than having to put it down in an email and wait for a response. So all of those things do make it helpful to actually be in chambers. And that leads me in quite nicely to the final thing, which is that um, there's quite a good social life scene in Chambers. Um, in particular, there's Chambers tea every day at four in the afternoon. So just when you're starting to flag, you can go and have a nice chat and a biscuit. Um, and it's really interesting because you get to see members of Chambers who aren't your supervisor and hear about the types of work that they're doing. Um, and that's a really good opportunity. Um, there's also sort of regular events like breakfast, lunch and, and drinks in the evening sometimes. Um, so you get to see people that way as well. And I would say that the, the social life of Chambers does include pupils. So I, I'm, I know that's not really the case at all Chambers, but I think that we do feel quite included by everyone, um, which is nice. Um, and then if I've not overrun, um, too much. I was just going to say three things that I think are unique about Radcliffe. Um, so one's already been covered by Louis, and um, that's that there is a practice in second six, um, and that's not 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 the case at all commercial chancery chambers. In fact, it's quite unusual in this area. The second is uh, that Radcliffe offers pupillage with a view to tenancy. So um, they don't offer pupillage um, unless there's a vacancy at the end of it. Um, and there's a really good record of taking on pupils as tenants. Um, and the third is that, um, that there's quite a clear vision in Chambers for the development of, cha of Chambers as a whole um, and of individual practice development as well. Um, and those are, I guess those are the things that stood out to me when I was applying. Um, and so hopefully those are things that will sound good to you um, when you're thinking about those applications as well. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, Amber. And I just like to echo those three things actually, because I did pupillage a couple of years ago now, but those were three things which I um, thought at the time, and actually my time in chambers has, has only served to confirm that. Um, so it's it's good to hear that that message is still getting through. Um, we've received a few questions, so and some of them are I'm going to just open up to the floor a little bit. Um, the first is potentially quite difficult. Um, but, uh, and so I'll send it to my old supervisor, Dan Burton, first. Um, what would you say is the, is the most important quality um, for a barrister, a junior barrister to have or display? Right. Um, well, I, th I think this goes back to something I was saying to Dave earlier. Uh, I think really, if you distill the, the, the bar, it's about relationships and judgment. And judgment is... Um, something that's innate, that's something that you can learn. It's knowing, uh, for example, a rather prosaically time management, how to take on enough, knowing your own limits, being able to meet deadlines, being able to organise cases, uh, knowing how uh, to, to deal with a particular kind of case or scenario. Uh, it means professionalism, ethics. So all of these things can really be sort of tied up into this uh, rather nebulous concept of judgment. And some, some people have it in spades naturally. Um, you, you'd like to think part of the interview process is weeding out not people who are just academic, but people who are personal, but people who have the right judgment to know when to make an argument, to know how to interact with people. And I think all of that really comes down to that key thing. And I mean, it's quite ironic really that that's uh, you know we're, one of the ways of progressing at the bar is becoming more senior than becoming a judge where it is literally your judge your job to exercise judgment so i think that's key uh, the other thing is relationships whether it's relationships with your um, co um, uh, barristers with your clerks with your um, um, ceo um, relationships with clients um, we're, we're now in an environment where it's no longer acceptable to be um, um, sort of uh, a non-marketer. Um, there are many, many barristers around, so perhaps the old-fashioned perception of the Chancery Bar is that, well, if someone was a bit odd, it was because they, they were brilliant, and so therefore you didn't question that they were odd and a bit antisocial. Well, now, I mean, there, there are so many, you know, excellent chambers and excellent barristers around. You, you, you have to be an all-rounder, and you have to have the ability to uh, make relationships with uh, people professionally, um, socially. So those are the sort of two main things I'd say, uh, judgment and uh, relationships. 
Oh, I, I think I think it'd be very difficult to disagree with that, with any of that. Um, just moving on as well, we've had a question about the the, the differences or potential differences between uh, being a barrister and being a solicitor. Um, David, I wonder if I could ask you first of all why? Because uh, obviously the two professions are so closely linked. Why did you choose to become a barrister? And then I'm actually gonna after that maybe Louis, you could then jump in because um, you've sort of seen the light and made the switch. Um, so, so if we go with David first. Thanks, Dan. Um, so when I was in my second year uh, undergraduate law degree, I did a vacation placement at a firm, city firm called Allen and Avery, uh, and spent four weeks living the life of a training solicitor, um, which was fa fascinating, uh, and told me that I didn't want to account for every six minutes of my life for the rest of my career. Uh, and that's another way of saying that I particularly value the independence of being at the self-employed bar. So one of the things that I most like about my job is that I do it on my own terms. Uh, I get to work, relatively speaking, when I want to work. Um, I think Amber was um, alluding very gently to the idea that somebody might stop work early and go home. Um, I, and you can, um, because you're not hidebound to a boss or a billing target or anything like that. And more fundamentally than that, I like the sound of my own voice. Uh, and so I wanted to be standing up in court and making the argument at the cutting edge of the argument and dealing with the client's case. What I didn't want to be doing um, was the work that suits many people, which is dealing with the clients day to day, managing their affairs, managing the behind the scenes type work, perhaps it's a reflection of my personality, I don't know. Um, I wanted to be the person standing up, making the argument um, and um, testing my own mettle uh, at that very sharp point uh, of uh, a client's case. Uh, so that's why I came to the bar rather than going off to this. So um, I similarly did a vacation scheme in my second year of my law undergrad, um, but I accepted the offer. Uh, and so I, I qualified and practiced for a year um, at a, a US corporate law firm called Sutherland and Cromwell. Um, and I spent some time in London, I spent some time in New York, and I mainly did uh, finance, leverage finance transactions and uh, restructuring work. Um, and I realized very quickly after starting, after starting my training contract that it wasn't really for me. One of the first things I did as a trainee was to go um, and take a note of a conference uh, with um, uh, uh, a barrister who is now Mr. Justice uh, Zaccarelli, who's a, a, a High Court judge, um, who does a lot of insolvency and restructuring. It was quite an interesting problem, uh, but he was the one providing the answers. He was the one doing the legal analysis. Uh, and so if you enjoy the law, and I, I think this is what became obvious quite quickly, if you enjoy the law, if you enjoy thinking about the law, making legal arguments, then the bar is, I think, far and away the uh, most exciting and intellectually stimulating way of doing that. If in addition, which I was, uh, you're attracted by the freedom of being self-employed, then I think there's no better profession. Um, and I'm totally sold on those two aspects. and I have no regrets at all about the move. One thing I'd say, though, is that that's not for everyone. Um, there are always trade-offs. Uh, you may value uh, more than me uh, working as part of a team or the security that comes with working in a law firm, uh, or the clarity um, of career progression that you get when you're in a law firm. So there's a very clear there are stages to your career. You're an associate, then a senior associate, then a partner. Uh, whereas here, success is more, there are e easy markers, like becoming you know, King's Counsel, but uh, success is, is perhaps uh, less easy to define in a straightforward way at the bar than it is in a law firm. Uh, so I think, if you're hesitating, um, I would definitely try both. I'd, I'd do a mini and try a vacation scheme. Just don't do what I did. Uh, don't accept a training contract uh, without ever doing a, a mini pupillage because you may come to regret that. Thanks very much, Louis. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really common problem, I think, um, particularly amongst law students, because I remember uh, in particular law firms would come down to our campus and take us out for dinner and do various um, fairly passive aggressive marketing uh, to try and convince you how amazing they were. But um, I too have no regrets for much of the same, many of the same 
reasons you uh, alluded to. Um, Amber, you mentioned the um, the application process in a little bit more detail. And Dan, I know you used to be on the uh, pupillage committee until very recently. Um, I wondered, Dan, if I could um, ask you for a couple of tips. Met, first of all, with the first round interview, which, as Amber said, is a bit more general. And second of all, with respect to the second round, which involves a piece of written work and that mock conference. Yes, um, certainly. Well, I I was on the committee for maybe six years or so, and I remember walking into Lincoln's Inn for my interview, at, at, well, three, three or four sets around it, feeling absolutely petrified. And, um, you know, it, it, it is a very um, stressful process. And I think Amber said earlier, you know, she remembers writing those applications in sort of dark Januarys. And, and look, this, you know, it, 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 it is a very difficult process. What I would say psychologically is it's a different process because you don't have to be in the top 20 or 25 of a couple of hundred people apply. You need to be in the top one or two. And whether you're in the top one or two is necessarily in some way subjective. So don't beat yourself up if you have a couple of interviews and don't and don't get a, a second round interview. It, 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 it's often not possible. We, we, we do as thorough an interview process as we can, and there's an objective marking scheme, and we you know all, all of the people's committees are sort of trained in fair re recruitment, but often it's very, very difficult to distinguish yourselves to be that sort of top one or two. So the key is is don't get despondent about it. Um, so some technical things you can do. Now, the Chantry Bar is quite technical, whether it's traditional Chantry or commercial Chantry, your written work has to be excellent. And a, a key indicator of if your written work isn't excellent is attention to detail. So I know it sounds really, really simple, but make sure any piece of writing that you hand in, whether it's your CV or a covering letter or your written work, presentation is spotless because it's just giving away points when really, you know, that, that presentation is uh, expected of you because it's the same thing at the bar. If you've drafted a skeleton argument for the, say, you know, for Court of Appeal, for example, and it doesn't look right or it's full of typos, that you're not gonna have trust in what and what's being written on it. So um, that's very important. In terms of covering letters, we, we, we ask people to write covering letters um, rather than fill in an application form. And it's amazing how many people with, D Phil at Cambridge or first class degrees from Oxford can't, can't, write a, uh, can't write a covering letter. So, you know, think about what you're writing. Legal writing requires clarity. It has to be crisp. It's very different to academic writing. Academic writing, and I, I was one, one myself, I got caught up in this. You end, the way you write academically, if you're doing your dissertation, for example, it's very, very different to how you write or need to write if you're writing an opinion or you're writing a skeleton argument. So try and think about um, the skill of written advocacy and being as crisp and as clear as possible. So that and attention to detail and, um, uh, and try not to lose confidence as well if you have a couple of interviews which you feel don't go particularly well. I mean, for a, a great example is for Radcliffe, for example, I felt that my first round interview here didn't, didn't go very well at all. And I was you know, pleasantly surprised to come back to a second round interview. Whereas conversely, I, I had a first round at another chamber, which I thought went brilliantly, and then I didn't, I didn't hear again. So um, it's necessarily sub subjective in a way. So don't, don't, don't take it to heart too much and keep trying. Thanks very much. And I, just to add in, I think one piece of advice that um, a QC or a KC now once gave me when I was interviewing is, you know, walk into the room and think about the sort of barrister that the panel will want to instruct themselves. How do you convey that sense of professionalism and confidence and, you know, try and appear as, as assured as possible? Um, obviously, the, the, your written application and your written work needs to be flawless or as flawless as it can be. But I think it's important to remember the other side too, that, that you know, we are uh, to, ex to a certain extent now, uh, service providers, we, we do fairly corporate jobs. People have certain expectations of their barrister, um, which go beyond, I think, um, you know, the gray haired, um, fossil, uh, fossil who's sat, you know, dust covered, sat, sat around dust covered books. Um, I'm conscious of the time. So I'm gonna try and squeeze two more questions in. Amber, the first is, um, we've had a question about juggling applications alongside other commitments. So I think you got pupillage on the bar course, is that right? Um, yeah. So I wondered maybe you could give a little bit of a, a, a 30 second um, 
set of tips as to how people might just manage their time a little bit. Okay. Slight caveat is that when I did my pupillage applications, we were in lockdown. So I had very little else to occupy my time. Um, but having said that, um, I think there are things that you can do to make it easier. Um, it, it's, I think it is easier if you're doing something like the bar course where you're thinking about law and the bar all the time. Um, but certainly if you're not, um, coming to things like this is quite a good idea because you are sort of getting your ear into what's going on. Um, there are things you can do that might not feel like they're directly helpful, but they are still helpful. So just reading the news, reading the Inner Temple Daily Digest. These are things where you can sort of trick yourself and feel like you're switching off um, and that you're giving yourself a break. But at the same time, you are helping the whole uh, process of, of being aware of things. Um, give yourself a break. That That's also a really important thing to say um, and not just the kind of um, trick breaks like that. Um, you'll between the written applications and the interviews, you, you hopefully will get a little bit of a break and make sure you use that time um, because it is quite intense in January. Um, so you need to make sure that you, you still have the stamina to get through the whole process because it's January to May, um, not just January. Um, so I would say, yeah, keep, um, keep giving yourself a break to, to make sure you've got the stamina to get through it all. Um, do things that are interesting but also helpful and then you can kill two birds with one stone um, I'm sorry to cut you off Amber um, I'm just I'm just conscious to get through some of the questions um and the last one I think um David as, as the most senior member of the panel I think this one will have to come to you um and it's how has the Chancery Bar changed over the last five ten years and, and how do you see it changing going forward um again potentially quite a difficult question but uh Apologies. Um, thanks, Dan. I, I think for senior, you mean old. Um, the, um, the, the Chantry Commercial Bar is changing. It's changing for the better and it's becoming more diverse, both um, in terms of, or not both, but in terms of um, background, um, gender, race, sexuality, different characteristics are now um, welcomed uh, at Chancery Commercial Bar, uh, and that is work that's ongoing. There's a long way to go, but great changes have already happened in that regard. Um, and um, I'm on the EDI committee at Radcliffe, um, which has also made great strides to uh, ensure fair recruitment. Um, and uh, Dan uh, alluded to that. Um, <clears throat> the Chancery Bar is modernising. You might not believe it, um, but it is. Um, the uh, the courts and the roles building are modern, they're technology driven, um, work is done electronically, it's done remotely, it's done at pace. Um, gone are the days when it took a month to organise a conference with council to get everybody's diaries to coincide, because you can do a half hour call on Teams the same afternoon usually, uh, and uh, the agility um, that the bar has always had um, continues and improves. Uh, and I think uh, really those would be my two main points. Diversity is improving and getting better. Uh, there's work to do, but we're going in the right direction. And work and work practices are modernising. Great. Uh, thanks, David. Um, right. Well, I think that is us at six o'clock on the dot. Um, all that remains for me to say is to thank our full panellists very much for giving uh, an hour of their time. Um, I hope those of you who have been watching along live and asking questions have found this interesting and useful. But yeah, as I say, that is us. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us uh, and thanks for watching.